Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I would appreciate short and succinct questions and answers. Question one, John Lamont. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to address the attainment gap between children from the poorest and wealthiest homes. Cabinet Secretary Mike Russell. Presiding Officer, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report on closing the attainment gap in Scottish education, which was published last week, confirms that the attainment gap between children from higher low income households has begun to narrow. The report also recognises the potential of key Scottish Government policies, such as Curriculum for Excellence and the Early Years Collaborative, to make a significant impact on further reducing this gap. I wholeheartedly agree with the report's conclusions, but there is still much to be done. The reasons for the attainment gap are complex, including, as the report notes, factors in a child's home background, and will require partnership working over a range of policy areas. We and our partners are strongly committed to tackling this. We're supporting a range of activities at national and local level, which will make a real difference and help to make Scotland the best place to go to school. But I'm sure the member will allow me to say that closing the attainment gap also needs to involve tackling the root causes of poverty, something which only independence will give us the economic powers to, so to do. On Lamont. Um, well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his um, response, but I do question whether the Government um, are doing enough. Last month's figures obtained by the Scottish Conservatives revealed that in 2013, 2.9% 2 of children from Scotland's most deprived homes achieved three A's or higher, compared to 20.3% from the most affluent. This gap is a vicious circle which prevents children from realising their full potential. Now, while the Cabinet Secretary is full, fully aware of this fact, he seems very reluctant to consider any fundamental changes to our system of schooling to resolve the problem. Surely, in the, name of, in the name of equality of opportunity, we need a much bolder agenda that empowers head teachers, increases autonomy and gives parents and pupils real choice when it comes to schooling. Well, I certainly agree with the member that we need to make sure that we take every possible action to improve the situation in Scotland. Uh, and that's what this government is attempting to do. Uh, and it doesn't mean tinkering with the system in the way that the leader of the, the member's party has suggested. What it means is fundamental and radical change to society. And that comes about, for example, by making sure that the powers to set taxation, to deal with welfare, to deal with labour market regulation lie in this parliament. And that would make a significant difference. What it also means, presiding officer, is you don't do things to make the situation worse. You don't, for example, create welfare policies, yeah. which, according to the Child Poverty Action Group, yeah. will mean that 100,000 more children will be in poverty by the year 2020. The biggest contribution the Tories could make would be to understand that and to stop penalising the poor in Scotland. Thank you. Here's your next mail. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether he saw Mind the Gap, Labour's Social Justice Sounding Board paper on tackling educational inequality? Is he aware that there were 12 recommendations in that report that don't require independence? Has he read it and is he willing to do some cross-party work in this area? Well, I, I did read it and I'm delighted to say that that work is already underway and if the Labour Party wants to support that work, I'm absolutely thrilled. Um, I, I, I read it with a little curiosity because this is not a, a manifesto, it is not a set of pledges, it's not even a pre-manifesto. It's apparently to inform the debate before the pre-manifesto process. Now, I'm not entirely sure how that works, but if I look at these 12, preventative spending in the crucial early years, absolutely, and we need to do that and do more. Building relationships between families, schools and communities, axiomatic, I'd have said, being done. Engendering a positive and welcoming atmosphere in preschool and school settings. I go to lots of schools and preschools. There is a positive and welcoming atmosphere, and I'm glad it's now recognised by Labour. High quality, flexible and affordable childcare. Well, that requires, that requires, in the end, the full powers of independence. And I could go on. We are doing a great deal. I'd be delighted to do it cross-party. And if we could do it cross-party, then we would do everything we could do. But there would still be a gap to close. And it's the gap of poverty. And that gap gets closed once this parliament has the powers of a normal, independent parliament. Many thanks. Question two, Dennis Roberts. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether our teachers and school nurses have the appropriate skills to notice early signs of mental health problems with our primary and secondary school pupils. Mr Alistair Allen. Education authorities and other agencies have duties under the Additional Support for Learning Act 2004 as amended to identify, provide for and review the additional support needs of their pupils. An additional support need can arise for any reason and be of short or long term duration. 
Additional support may be required to overcome needs arising from learning environment, health or disability, family circumstances or social and emotional factors, and does, yes, include mental health. Dennis Robertson. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister is probably aware that I have a particular interest in eating disorders. And at the end of last year, I was uh, very privileged to open a conference raising the awareness of eating disorders within schools attended by nurses and uh, school nurses and teachers. This programme was subsequently uh, rolled out at Murray House. Does the Minister believe that this sort of programme would enable our teachers and school nurses to be more aware of some of the mental health problems within our age group at school? And would he um, a, look at trying to commend this programme to other schools? Thank you very much, Minister. Well, it is greatly to the member's credit that he uh, raises this issue with uh, this persistence because uh, I would certainly acknowledge that the issue of, of eating disorders and their early detection uh, is profoundly important in our schools. Uh, it's for that reason that uh, programmes like these are indeed encouraged and also uh, for these reasons and others that uh, nurses uh, are prepared uh, through a uh, competency framework for nursing in schools and indeed teachers uh, are now increasingly prepared uh, to be aware of the needs of all learners uh, and again I would uh, commend all involved in the early detection of uh, eating, orders in schools, eating disorders in school. Mary Scanlon. If mental health issues are identified at nursery, primary or secondary school, which require more than can be given at school in terms of additional support needs, for example, diagnosis, support and treatment, if the parents do not agree with this identification of mental health issues, what can the education authorities do? Minister? Well, uh, one of the focuses, obviously, of, of the government uh, uh, in when it comes to, to dealing with these and other issues uh, in uh, uh, young children is getting it right for every child and ensuring that the relationship exists between professionals uh, and families to, to overcome some of these, these early problems. Every school now has a, a named contact uh, specialist, children uh, and adolescent mental health services, and teachers are uh, increasingly trained to be able to refer people in these sensitive situations to, to professional, professionals and specialists uh, who are there to help. Thank you very much. Question three, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's having with local authorities about the increase in pupils in primary and secondary schools with additional support needs. Minister. The implementation of the Additional Support for Learning Act is discussed regularly with local authorities through uh, contact with the Association of Directors of Education, uh, the Association of Support for Learning Officers and the Advisory Group for Additional Support for Learning. The increase in pupils in primary and secondary schools with additional support needs is, it should be said, a result of an extension in the recording and reporting of statistics rather than an actual change in the number of pupils receiving support. The advisory group for additional support for learning will consider this year how we ensure a continued improvement in the way we collect additional support needs statistics and how we can use this information to ensure the needs uh, of children and young pe people are met. Ms. Smith. Could I thank the Minister for the answer? Uh, he will, I think, uh, have sight of a letter I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary on Monday this week, reporting back on the seminar that we had on Friday, uh, in which the key stakeholders in additional support for learning identified one of the main issues as being the fact about uh, the insistence, but in some local authorities, that children with additional support for need had to be in mainstream school when in fact that is not in uh, their best interest in every case. Could I ask what the Scottish Government is doing to uh, try to influence the decision for special schools uh, to use their expertise, and particularly some of the special schools who are in the independent sector? Well, the, the member raises a, an important uh, issue around the, the question of an inclusion, and while there is certainly a, an, a, an injunction to include, um, the government has never at any stage said that uh, all children can be included in all mainstream classes, uh, and for that reason there is, if you like, a, a mixed economy uh, available. But it is important to include where inclusion is possible. And I would like to return again to the, the point I made earlier, which is that we, of course, anticipated that there would be an increase in the number uh, recorded with uh, uh, additional support needs because of the way that the statistics were collected. But as I say, uh, the, the, uh, there is an injunction to include, but not a compulsion uh, in all and every circumstance. Thank you. Liam MacArthur. 
Uh, thank you very much. The Minister will be, uh, I think, recall that the, uh, the, the figures emerged in response to a question I, I lodged uh, with him, and he'll also be aware of uh, quite wide disparity in terms of the figures for different local authorities. I think he slightly alluded to that in his responses to Liz Qu uh, Smith's questions, but can he perhaps uh, inform the Chamber of, of, of any thinking about how we can get greater consistency about how those figures are collected, but also uh, ensure that there is appropriate training in uh, place for teachers, particularly where uh, the additional support needs are of a complex nature. Minister. Well, as I mentioned in, in response to, to earlier questions, that there is increasingly a, a, a focus on initial and ongoing teacher training uh, to recognise a whole variety of additional needs and, and to respond to those. Uh, it is the case to say that different local authorities may take a, a different approach. I suppose that is a, a feature of having uh, these services run locally and a feature uh, ultimately of, of local decision making and local democracy. Uh, but I'm more than happy to discuss with the member if he has any, uh, any local concerns he wishes to bring to me. Many thanks. Question four, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how Scotland's universities will benefit from the EU's £80 billion, uh, £80 billion Euro Horizon 2020 programme. Standing officer, Scotland's universities and research organisations benefited from the previous research innovation programme, Framework Programme 7, to the tune of €538 million. Euros. With an even larger budget than FP7 of around €80 billion, Euros, Horizon 2020 offers vast opportunities for our world-class universities to benefit to an even greater extent than before. And I'm therefore encouraging as much engagement with the programme as I can, and I would encourage every university to engage, every higher education, further education institution, and for members to become familiar with the programme and to encourage participation wherever they can. Thanks. Bob Doris. Uh, President Officer, I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that Scotland's universities outperform the rest of the UK in research and innovation. They're well placed to benefit from that €80 billion Euro fund. However, is he also aware that application criteria requires partners from three different EU member states to apply for these funds and that consequently, given our close partnership already with the rest of the UK's academic institutions, that an independent Scotland will, can actually maximise our ability to reap the benefits of that €80 billion Euro pot of cash, but also so can England's universities? And so you know, surprisingly, I hear Labour members laughing at that, but in actual fact, that is yet another wonderful example of what in the, the benefits of an independent would bring to Scotland. Because uh, with Scotland as an independent member and with the rest of the UK as an independent member, we already have two countries that could participate. With the addition of only a third country, we have yeah. viable programmes. Now, one of the difficulties has often been in getting those three member states to participate, particularly because particularly because Mr Bibby, unfortunately, is not interested in this answer because he's talking to somebody else. But if he were to pay attention to it, he would discover that one of the difficulties that existed in this programme for a considerable period of time was the inability for our voice to be heard over the voice of the rest of the UK. So if we were an independent member state working with the rest of the UK, there would be an even better situation. I can hardly wait. Question five, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made towards ensuring that speech and language therapies are available in Gaelic medium schools. Minister. Good progress has been made recently. This includes an audit commissioned by Boris McGaelic. The preparation of Gaelic resources for schools and plans are now in place for an additional support needs speech and language therapy seminar in June, which will be for those working in Gaelic medium education. Yeah, Angus MacDonald. I thank the Minister for his reply. I am aware of the Gaelic Research Conference at the University of Edinburgh in June, which I hope to attend. Uh, I am aware that work is ongoing with NHS Scotland and local authorities. However, I think it is fair to say that provision of speech and language therapy for Gaelic pupils around the country is patchy. Will the Minister give an assurance that work will continue to ensure SLT is available in all GM sco GME schools if required? Minister. Well, I would certainly uh, agree about the importance of this issue and uh, can confirm, obviously, that with the, the government looking at uh, the whole wider issue of guidance for Gaelic medium education, I'm sure it will be one of the, the issues that will be looked at. But I think it's, it's also uh, relevant to say that while services at present may not always be provided in Gaelic, um, there is a discussion ongoing around uh, the new resources and the best way to, to ensure that uh, wherever it is possible, it is. Many thanks. Question six, Christina McKelvey. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what investment it plans to improve the learning experience in its university estate. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> 
Presiding officer, through the Scottish Funding Council, the Scottish Government is providing £34.8 million of capital funding for our universities in financial year 2014-15. Total sums invested in university estates this year will be a matter for dialogue between the Funding Council and individual institutions. Christina McKelvey. The Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that the best environments for young people uh, to learn is the most innovative and the most flexible learning environments. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet with me, the innovative team at the University of the West of Scotland's Hamilton campus, who have actually got some amazing aspirational ideas in creating that innovative, learning, flexible envir environment? Cabinet Secretary. I'm always happy to meet with the local member about this issue, and I'd be very happy to, to take her up on her offer. I did spend part of Monday afternoon with the uh, leadership team at the University of the West of Scotland at their uh, campus, uh, at their uh, in, uh, facility on the Crichton campus in Dumfries. I was very impressed with the work that they're doing and their ambitions. I'm sure they have very similar ambitions for Hamilton. We are very constrained in capital expenditure, and that is one of the prices that we pay for being part of the union, and I hope that that will change over a period of time. I understand the member has a meeting with representatives of the Scottish Funding Council next week to discuss the Hamilton campus, and following on that, of course, I'll be happy to meet with her and UWS. Many thanks. Question seven, Rob Gibbs. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in support for the use of Scots language in the Curriculum for Excellence. Alistair Allen. Our ambition is for Scots to be recognised, valued and used in Scottish life uh, and in schools. Uh, the teaching and learning of Scots is included in the Curriculum for Excellence and provides opportunities for children and young people to become confident individuals, giving them knowledge uh, of cultural heritage and a national perspective. Uh, the role of the recently appointed Scots language coordinators at Education Scotland will help, I believe, to support practitioners in teaching Scots while developing Scots in the curriculum and resources around that. Thank you. Rob Gibson. I thank the Minister very much for that uh, and welcome the Scots language coordinators in post. Since the opportunities to read and use Scots language can help develop enthusiasm, motivation for learning, openness to new ideas, self-respect and uh, respect for others, all attributes that uh, fit the curriculum for excellence, um, are the guidelines for the curriculum for excellence uh, available to teachers in a clear form that sets Scots language up in its own right. Minister. At present, uh, Scots language is located under the languages curriculum area of the Curriculum for Excellence, and within that, the literacy and English sections uh, of the experiences and outcomes. So yes, uh, Scots language is identified within that context. And specific mention is made therein, should be said, of the importance of uh, engaging with a wide range of texts, for instance, in Scottish literature. Uh, I think the uh, one of the things that uh, has, has come to pass without perhaps some of the predicted, uh, predicted uh, disaster is that now uh, young people in Scotland are quite used to sitting uh, exams with, with Scottish literature in them and indeed increasingly enthusiastic about awards such as uh, Scottish studies. Thank you. Question 8, Colin Keir. To ask the Scottish Government how universities will progress in an independent Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer in an independent Scotland, our excellent higher education sector, a world-beating higher education sector, could further extend its already considerable reach. Gaining control over the financial levers that drive growth will support more world-class research and innovation. In addition, framing our own immigration policies would help ensure that the brightest international talent is attracted to and retained by Scotland's universities. Thank you very much. Colin Keir. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Does she agree with the comments made by Professor Paul Boyle of the Research Council UK that international collaborative research is extremely important and that post-independence this should continue? Cabinet Secretary. I certainly do agree with Professor Boyle that international collaborative research is extremely important. As Professor Petra Vend of Queen Margaret University said in her evidence to the same Education and Culture Committee session on the 25th of March, mm. academic research is collaborative by nature. Research does not only stretch to the rest of the UK or Europe, but is truly international. I think that's a, a fair point. Our universities already have a, a number of high-profile partnerships with many prominent European uh, partners. Just to take one example, the Scottish Universities Physics Alliance launched the first international Max Planck partnership. Strathclyde University is in partnership with the Fraunhofer Institute. The University of Dundee, is with, the, uh, with the Innovation Medicines Initiative, is in the European Lead Factory Programme. 
With independence, we'd seek to continue uh, the continuity of a single research area within the UK, maintaining long-term stability in research mm -hmm. funding and systems that support initiatives of scale to both Scotland and the UK, collaborating and supporting what is and will remain a world-class research base. Thank you very much. Les Smith. Uh, could I ask the Cabinet Secretary on what criteria the Scottish Government is making the judgment that the subscription model of university research would be superior to the amount of money that can be uh, maintained through the present UK structure? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it is absolutely axiomatic that the excellence of Scottish um, higher education will win out no matter what. Uh, it is desirable that we take part in the research councils on the basis of equality, and it's desirable that we keep that um, decision-making on research, uh, and that's a key point, uh, under the Haldane principle. So in the, all those circumstances, what we are talking about is an enhancement of a system that works so far. There are some elements in the system of which we are critical. The member will be aware of the issue of postdoctoral research hubs <clears throat> and the way in which actually drawing those together in one or two places may damage some of the excellence within Scotland. So there needs to be a discussion and exchange of ideas. But the people who know best about this are very often the people doing it. And I was immensely heartened to see in the Scotsman, in the Herald just last week, 103 Scottish academics, or 102. I'm not entirely sure there were so many uh, uh, arguing that in actual fact it was independence that was required in order to make the, the full potential of Scotland's research uh, uh, activity uh, uh, achieve what it can achieve. Thank you. Question nine, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that there are enough supply teachers available in rural schools. Cabinet Secretary. It is important that we have the right number of teachers with the right skills in the right places. With this in mind, the Scottish Government undertakes an annual teacher workforce planning exercise in consultation with other relevant stakeholders to determine the requirement for newly qualified teachers. The exercise includes provision for supply teachers. The recent involvement of the University of the Highlands and Islands in teacher education will help the situation. I welcome the SNCT's decision to amend the pay arrangements for teachers undertaking short-term supply work, and that will also help. Ultimately, however, as a member knows, the sourcing of appropriate supply cover is a matter for individual local authorities to address through their own workforce planning measures as the employers of teachers. Thank you. Rhoda Grant. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. He'll be aware that due to the shortage in supply teachers, education officials in Murray are having to return to the classroom to teach children. And those shortages are due to some of the issues that he highlighted, less teachers being trained. So ma maybe he will review his workforce planning tool to make sure that sufficient teachers are being trained. Also, when reviewing the salaries paid to supply teachers, can he take into account the rate of salary that would make it attractive to, for supply teachers to travel to rural and remote schools? Well, I think both of those issues have been covered. The issue of fewer supply teachers uh, is, uh, is a problem for some local authorities, but it's being addressed. It's being addressed by making sure that there are more teachers being trained, and I've brought that forward. And indeed, I met this morning with the University of the Highlands and mm -hmm. Islands to talk about their teacher training activity. And I would hope that we could continue to take that trend forward. It is also being addressed by making sure that the change which came about in 2011 mm -hmm. at the agreement of the trade unions, and it's very important to stress that, the member somehow omitted to say that, but the SNCT agreement in 2011 was an agreement between all three parties which, uh, who are, who are who are part of the SNCT. That agreement was changed this year in the light of new negotiation to uh, ensure that uh, the, any disincentives that existed for some people to undertake supply work was removed. Those things are definitely happening and will continue to happen. And I do think we are beginning to see an easing of this situation. But I, I do think also we've managed to resolve the difficulty of oversupply of teachers, a problem which, as the member knows, I think uh, can largely be placed at the door of a previous administration uh, which trained too many teachers without being able to pay for them. Question 10, Margaret McCullough. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to people returning to education, training or employment who have very young children. Minister Aileen Campbell. The Scottish Government is taking a range of action to support parents of young children returning to education, training or employment. We know that high quality, flexible, accessible and affordable childcare is a vital source of support for those parents who are working, studying or training. And that's why the Children and Young People Act will deliver increased and more flexible early learning and childcare. 
We're also providing record levels of financial support to college students and ensuring our training programmes are developed to include the support necessary for those with very young children. Thank you very much. Margaret McCullough. Mm. Parents of children with disabilities face particular challenges when they try to go back to work or education in the early years of their child's life. Could the Minister therefore explain why SNP members of the European Parliament voted against extending maternity leave for parents of disabled children? And would the Minister accept that the SNP's poor voting record on the rights of working parents in Europe does not bode well for the Convention of Employment does not bode well for the Convention on Employment and Labour Relations, which it proposes to create in the event of a yes vote this September. Minister. I think it would be important for Margaret McCulloch to recognise that following a yes vote in September, we'll have control over maternity and paternity levels. Yeah. We'll be able to take control and make sure that that, that works for the best interests of children and families. Absolutely. And, you know, on the very important point about making sure that we support families with disabled children, I'm happy to, to take any points that Margaret McCulloch wants to, to raise if there are specific things that she's wanting to try and tackle for her parents, if, or her, for her constituents. But I think it's important to recognise that the point that she is, she is raising is a reserved uh, issue and that is the crux of the independence yeah, argument. It's about making sure we yeah. in this parliament yeah, have the yeah. proper powers yeah. to support parents and families and not to make the snide political points that she makes yeah. from the yeah. sidelines. Thank you. Right, you all calm down a little. Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I just say, as both a member of the SNP and a parent of a disabled child, I am very disappointed by the comments that Margaret McCulloch has made in trying to politicise the issue around who cares Question. around parents with disabled children. But does the Minister agree that in order to deliver the kind of transformational, flexible childcare that is required, we need, as Professor Sir Donald Mackay has pointed out, control of both sides of the balance sheet? Otherwise, the income that is generated from encouraging people back into the workforce does not, is not retained by the Scottish Government and therefore cannot be reinvested in the way that we would like to see. Minister. Uh, absolutely. I think Donald Mackay's points that he raised are, are very pertinent. Indeed, so too is the, the words of Bronwyn Cohen, who is the former Chief Executive of Children in Scotland, who made a similar point as well. Because the fact of the matter is that Mark Macdonald raises is that unless we have both sides of the balance sheets, then we can't retain the money that is generated through having increased participation in the workforce through parents who are unable to get back into work through increased childcare. We won't be able to retain that money to reinvest that back into childcare to create the type of childcare system that will emulate the best in Europe. That's what we'll get if we have the yes vote in September. Thank you. Question 11, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of what impact the reported decreasing levels of numeracy in schools will have on the uptake of so-called STEM subjects in further and higher education. Minister Alistair Allen. The Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy is an important addition to our, our picture of learning and teaching of numeracy in Scotland. Much has been and is being achieved, however, there is still progress to be made. We all want to see the best possible outcomes achieved for every learner. We are continuing, therefore, to support improvement of numeracy levels, recently announcing an extra million pound funding over three years to expand the local authority numeracy hubs programme, which includes East Lothian's numeracy academy work. This is in addition to ongoing support for teachers and schools and numeracy from Education Scotland. And we do recognise a strong grounding in numeracy underpins learning across STEM-related subjects. We continue to see high uptake and attainment in science and mathematics qualifications in our schools, enabling young people to make strong transitions to further learning or employment. Thank you, Ian Gray. 2011, Skills Development Scotland's Skills Investment Plan for the Energy Sector put it very succinctly. It said... Engineering sectors were more likely than average to report issues in attracting skilled staff. Presiding officer, it stands to reason that fewer pupils doing well in numeracy, uh, uh, and that was the finding of the survey, although it was hard to uh, make that out from the minister's answer, that fewer pupils doing well in numeracy will mean fewer pupils pursuing science and maths through their academic and into their working, their academic careers and into their working lives. Uh, uh, the Scottish Government additional funding which was announced is of course very welcome, but it does amount to by next year a 0.0001% increase in the school's budget. Does he really believe that is an adequate response to such a serious problem? Minister. 
Well, firstly, I, I hesitate to take the member up on, on matters of, of maths or even arithmetic, but of course he will appreciate that the money concern is being focused specifically on the numeracy, yeah. and that's important. I, I would certainly acknowledge, I don't think anyone could take away from the fact that the, the statistics in question do show a dip in performance uh, in second year in schools. Uh, and I think uh, that is something we have to take seriously. It's, we have to look at issues around uh, the, the structure, the progression that goes into teaching numeracy and maths in schools. Um, but I think where the, the member's argument doesn't stand uh, is where he continues it to talk about qualifications, because the fact of the matter is there has been an increase in the number yep. of school leavers coming out of school with higher maths, for instance, went up from 19% of school leavers in 2007-8 to 24% in 2011-12. A great deal for us, to still to do, for us still to do, but the evidence is in the qualifications that uh, numeracy is having a positive effect on people. Thank you. Briefly, Jim Eady, please. I ask the Minister what improvement there has been in the maths performance of pupils by the time they reach the end of their secondary education and what impact this will have on the uptake of STEM subjects in further and higher education. Minister. Well, I've mentioned the improvements that there have been in the number or the proportion of school leavers uh, who are coming out of school with higher maths. It's also worth um, saying that the, the pass rates for higher maths have remained consistently high, uh, sitting at 72% in 2007 8 and that increased uh, to 73% in 2012 13 so, as I say, I don't take away from the importance of making sure that we get over the fact that there is a dip in performance in second year, but I do want to stress that the evidence is there in the qualifications that teachers are teaching numeracy and teaching it well. Many thanks. Question 12 in the name of Fiona MacLeod has been withdrawn and a satisfactory explanation provided. Question 13, Maureen Watt, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether Scotland's universities will continue to benefit from research funding from outside the country in the event of a yes vote in the independence referendum. Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, in Independent Scotland would continue to attract funding from research councils into which it had paid, as well as from Europe and international sources based on the international excellence of our universities and our world-class research base. Indeed, we believe independence will bring opportunities for increased research funding through collaborations with the private sector and with partners in Europe and beyond, facilitated by access to additional financial levers and our greater presence and profile on the world stage as an independent nation-state. As Professor Ferdinand von Pronzinski put it in his evidence to the Education and Culture Committee in March 2014, this government's objective he discerned as being, and I think it is, to ensure that a significant research fund is available to Scotland equal to or better than what is available now. Thank you. Maureen Watt. Phone for Maureen Watt, please. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Given that a recent letter to the Herald from over 100 academics, as the Cabinet Secretary already alluded to, including the signature of Professor Brian McGregor, Vice Principal of Aberdeen University, claiming that independence will allow research to thrive, is it also the case that the No campaign has failed to acknowledge the cumulative erosion of science funding in recent years and its impact on university research? And is this something an independent Scotland will seek to rectify? Uh, yes, very much so, I have to say. And of course, one of the fallacies of the No campaign is to try and present a, a picture in which everything is rosy uh, uh, with the, in the union. Of course, you have the... Have you, well, it is far from rosy. Let us look at the issue of pensions, for example, which are being eroded all the time by the union. Let's look at defence jobs, which are being eroded all the time by the union. I'd like to the answer union. the question. And let us look, and presiding officer, you are, you are quite right, let us look at research, because in research, it is the pressure upon UK government spending and the constant pressure that takes place in Westminster that is the real threat. And people are cleverer than I, Professor Brian McGregor, the vice principal of Aberdeen University, and 102 and 102 Just other academics, to be people, of, people of real experience in this field, pointing out that it is indeed the threat from the union that is the threat to higher education research, not the threat from independence. We have shown as a government our long-term commitment to research and knowledge exchange activities in Scotland, investing £364 million in 2013-14, a 38% increase in funding for research and knowledge exchange since 2007. Two-thirds of that funding supports the research space in our universities, and that's the type of thing that will be under threat from the Union. Thank you. Uh, question 14, Sandra White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the benefits to Scotland's education sector are of being part of the EU. Cabinet Secretary. 
taking higher education as an example, presiding officer, and I shall stick to higher education, Scotland's world-renowned universities play an active part in EU programmes such as Erasmus+. Plus. Institutions derive benefit from collaborative relationships. The European arena is indeed one where the quality of teaching, learning and research in Scottish universities can be promoted and advanced to extend our global reach and influence. Thank I much, thank, the cabinet secretary, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned earlier, as indeed my colleague Maureen Watt, also about the letter signed by over 100 highly respected academics rejecting the no campaigns, scaremongering on the continuation of cross-border research and funding. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that given funding to Scottish universities from Europe has been worth over 500 million euros since 2007, and now the 80 billion Horizon programme, that the real threat to research is the UK government's obsession with leaving Europe rather than playing an important part within it as an independent Scotland would do. Thank you very much. Ken. I wholeheartedly agree with the member. We've made it clear that, a, well, where wisdom is spoken by the member, we should all agree, and she has been very wise in this, because we have made it clear, as she has made it clear, that an independent Scotland wants to continue as a committed member of the EU. That will give it the access to these opportunities. It is the rest of the UK that would seek to drag Scotland out of the UK, out of the EU. And that, I have to say, yet again, would be an unacceptable price from staying in the Union. Thank you. Question 15, James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that my colleague Sandra White is indeed a very wise woman. Uh, to, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had regarding the Erasmus Plus programme, which supports young people into lifelong learning, and was mentioned in his last response. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government officials are working closely with colleagues in the UK Government and the National Agency for Erasmus Plus, which is jointly run by the British Council and ICORIS to ensure Scotland's interests are well represented in delivery of this programme. In recent weeks, Scottish officials have participated in the First Class Governmental Programme Board Meeting, attended the launch of Erasmus Plus, and met with national agency leads for Scotland. Okay, James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I know there are a lot of organisations, including Exchange Scotland, who I've had the pleasure of meeting on a few occasions, who support young Scots who want to access these opportunities through Erasmus Plus. What further assistance will be provided to the sector to ensure that the take-up of these opportunities continues to increase? Well, of course, uh, direct representation in Europe would help us in that matter, but we already provide significant support for the voluntary sector, uh, including youth or volunteer organisations like Exchange Scotland. Going forward, we're going to continue to support YouthLink, the National Agency for Youth Work in Scotland, to work with the British Council and partners to promote international and European youth work, provide guidance on Erasmus Plus and other European opportunities for youth workers and young people. And we've also funded NUS Scotland with £200,000 over the last two years to deliver a project which worked to increase awareness and uptake of student outward mobility opportunities, including those offered by Erasmus Plus. And of course, we now have a scheme that supports students to study in Europe. Thank you. Question 16, Stuart Maxwell. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on Professor Paul Boyle's view that Research Councils UK strongly support an independent Scotland remaining part of the network. I think I may have mentioned this earlier this afternoon, but uh, we indeed, the member says no, but I have a distinct memory of doing so. We welcome the comments no of Professor Boyle, then. Chief Executive of the Economic and Social Research Council. His comments are consistent with our proposition to maintain a common research area with the rest of the UK as outlined in Scotland's future, and in the paper, Higher Education Research in Independent Scotland, which I had the pleasure to launch on the 30th of April. Thank you, Stuart Maxwell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the 103 academics, I believe it's 103 Cabinet Secretary, that he mentioned earlier, who signed an open letter highlighting the advantages to university research from a yes vote? Uh, and deliberately, they most clearly pointed out that the only threat to funding for our universities comes from the Westminster's cuts agenda. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Uh, Neil Bibbett. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I think it's deeply regrettable uh, that Professor Paul Boyle and the Research Councils UK had to issue the following statement. The way the quote attributed to Professor Paul Boyle has been used is misleading in suggesting that research councils support an independent Scotland remain part of the UK research council system. Should there be a vote for independence, the current system could not continue. Does the Cabinet Secretary regret misrepresenting Professor Boyle, and will he now apologise to him for that? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I, I have to, I have to say that... A little bit of calm um, from everyone, please. Presiding officer, I, I've checked the record. Professor Boyle said what he said he said. Uh, and that is the... And any implication, any implication that's taken out of that has been drawn by a whole range of people. Um, what I do regret is that Mr Bibby has so little confidence, so little confidence in the research excellence of Scottish universities that he wants to undermine those, that, those, uh, those universities by implying that in some sense the excellence of those universities Order. would not win out, would not win out oh, in dear. terms of comp competition for funding. That is the problem that we have. I am sure the Professor can speak for himself, and indeed he did at the committee, and he said what he said. And finally, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taken to address the educational attainment gap between children from different social backgrounds. Okay, Officer, as I said earlier in my response to John Lamont, only with the full economic powers of independence will be able to do everything required to tackle the root cause of poverty and close the attainment gap. Our commitment to improve attainment has a firm foundation in all our key policies and programmes which affect children and young people, including Curriculum for Excellence, Teaching Scotland's Future, GERFEC, the Early Years Framework and Opportunities for All. These policies clearly set out what needs to be done and is being done to support every child and young person's successful learning journey. We're working to ensure that teachers and school leaders have the right skills and experience to deliver improved outcomes for all children and young people, including those who are most disadvantaged. Briefly, Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, I was a bit disappointed in the Minister's response uh, to the Mind the Gap report, given the calibre of the people from across the educational community who had been involved yeah. in that report. He selectively quoted Recommendation 3, which was about the link between the educational attainment of a parent and the development of the child. What work is the Scottish Government doing in this area when he says it's already happening? Okay, for example, to Bells Hill Academy, where I was some weeks ago, where I saw some excellent work being done involving parents and the whole school to bear down on the issue of attainment and to make sure by using data and by making sure that it's worked with individual uh, young people and parents that we can, in actual fact, see a difference. Now, I'd encourage the member to reflect on what is actually happening rather than not knowing what is happening and talking about it. Because if you reflect on what's actually happening, then you can see huge progress being made. But I welcome the support that would come from the Labour Party in that regard. If the Labour Party wants to support what is taking place in improving attainment, I would be delighted to see them on so side with that. I would be delighted to see them on side with Order. that. And having them on side with that, we could do even more than we're doing now. That would be a prize to have. Let's actually observe what is happening, and then let's work together to make sure that even more of it's happening. Producing a report that simply talks about things you might want to happen doesn't without reflecting on what is there isn't actually a very good idea. Thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we'll now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 100.